Hey guys, I'm Devin Harrington, the Average Gen Xer. Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, I thank you so much for stopping by. You know I would love it if you would subscribe, like, leave a comment, all those good things. And I thank you so much for being here. So on this channel, I talk about a couple of different topics. And today we are talking about the fantastic book, No Kids, 40 Good Reasons Not to Have Children. Uh, this is by French psychoanalyst Corinne Meyer. It was originally released in 2009 in France, and it caused a huge uproar. And then it was released in the States, and there was an even bigger backlash. So we're going to take a look at 10 reasons per episode. So this will be like a four-part series looking at this book. And let's just jump right into it. 'French psychoanalyst Corinne Meyer is a mother of two. You might be surprised learning that she wrote a book called 40 Good Reasons to ha Not to Have Kids. She does have kids. She tackles a politically incorrect topic, childlessness by choice. And this book, as I said, was originally published in 2009. So that was like 100 years ago. Uh, Corin Meyer is an economist, a historian, and a psychoanalyst. And she's written around 20 books, essays, pamphlets, narratives, and cartoon scripts. But this book, No Kids, is probably her most famous work. From Publishers Weekly, Author Meyer, who also wrote a book called Bonjour Laziness, a mother of two, delivers a corrosive take on children and parenting that's far more caustic than comedic. Originally published in France, these 40 reasons to avoid having children range from the familiar, the death of desire, the expense, the career sacrifice, to the outrageous. Children are disappointing. There are already too many. Pushing back against baby mania with unrelenting pessimism, sarcasm, and downright viciousness, quote, every family is an inescapable nest of vipers. For all her overwhelming histrionic bitching, Myers' admitted regret over having children is never really examined nor is her choice to have them in the first place. Any subject meriting deeper reflection is quickly dismissed. Readers who already resent children will sympathize with this book, but average breeders will likely be repulsed. So Publishers Weekly didn't love this book. They are basically saying that Corinne Meyer is a caustic bitch for daring to say that she regretted having children. And let's all keep in mind that this book came out in 2009. Although perhaps even if it did come out today, you know, there are still people discovering this book and thinking that she is a horrible person for having written it. So there was a Maclean's article published about this book. It's called The Case Against Having Kids. And of course, I will link it below. And just a piece of this article from Maclean's, it says, Now the childless in North America have their most defiant advocate in a mother of two, Corinne Meyer, a 45-year-old French psychotherapist whose manifesto, <laughs> now she's, you know, basically a cult leader writing a manifesto whose manifesto, No Kids, 40 Good Reasons Not to Have Children, created a furor when published in France. This article came out in 2010, so that was a year after the book was published. And it was just before the book was published in the States. Because the article goes on to say, count on the same happening when it's released here this week. Among Meyer's hard-won advice, quote, if you really want to be host to a parasite, get a gigolo. 
unquote. <laughs> she is French. I mean, come on. The societal shift in attitudes toward childlessness is most evident in language, with the buoyant child-free replacing childless, a word stigmatized for conveying a void or a handicap. And I have to say I agree with that. It is true. If you want kids, but you don't have them or you cannot have them biologically, uh, you are childless. If you don't want kids and you went out of your way not to have them like I did, then you are child free. So I have to agree with that. The article goes on. Childless, a word stigmatized for conveying a void or a handicap. The childless minority has always been with us. But in the past, why they didn't procreate wasn't the concern of mainstream academic study or social debate to the extent it was even considered. It was assumed that they couldn't due to some biological reason or chose not to for negative reasons, such as having had a bad childhood themselves. So now in the 21st century, uh, we finally are getting around to the good reasons not to have kids. And Ms. Corinne Meyer has given us 40 of them. So we're going to go over the first 10 in this post today. And let's just take a quick look at the little prologue here in Corinne Meyer's book. Prologue, the only solution, contraception. In 2006, France became the fertility champion of Europe. The French miracle was, crow was crowed about in victorious tones. Today in France, we are seeing a glorification of maternity that would have made Marshal Pétain proud. It's the new face of patriotism. If we must deal with the hell of living, then the more the merrier. Sounds much the same in the United States. Although I'm making this video in 2024 and the country of France just codified the right to an abortion in their national constitution. So vive la France. Everyone, take warning from France's example. In this deathly boring and moralistic world, they want you to think that happiness is to be found in your two breasts, in making babies, and in your job. The truth is that the more your fecundity increases, the fewer there are of you who can call yourselves happy. Open your eyes. Your kids are going to be the loser babies, quote unquote, destined for unemployment or precarious or inferior jobs. In other words, factory drones. Their lives will be way less fun than yours. And that's saying a lot. Listen, your marvelous babies have no future because every child born in a developed country is an ecological disaster for the whole planet. Man, Ms. Corinne, don't mess around. And you, you're going to spend 20 years of your life, quote, raising them. The education of children has become a sacrament. Society demands of modern parents a level of performance worthy of Superman or Superwoman that is true in the States as well. Always on call, smiling, attentive, teacherly, and responsible. Is there anything you won't do to guarantee the happiness and fulfillment of the kids? Becoming a parent means giving up everything else. Your life as a couple, your leisure time, your sex life, your friends, and if you're a woman, your career success. And I would add to that, don't forget your body as you once knew it. She goes on, all that for kids? Honestly, is it really worth it? Take the necessary precautions. Having children, it happens too quickly. The only solution is contraception. Reason number one for not having children. One, the desire for children is a silly idea. Wanting to reproduce yourself at any cost is to aspire to the pinnacle of banality. I'll admit that there is a certain amount of security in behaving like everyone else and acting just like your neighbor. To be accepted in today's society, 
means having a job, a baby, or both. Sign up and then sign up again. The decision not to have a child is taken as an indication of such procreative bitterness that it defies comprehension. Reproductively obsessed people are expected to undergo fertility treatment with the determination of Olympic athletes and with, it must be said, the complicity of doctors who find themselves a bit uneasy, but who wouldn't be working with science that is always one step behind. The craze for having children is so widespread these days that has, it has become a big business and is growing fast. And Ms. Corinne goes on. On my left, there's the so-called right to have a child. This has become such a sacred trust that you almost expect it to turn up in the preamble to the Constitution. The child has become so indispensable, so miraculous, that everyone must exercise their right to it. But what about the right not to have a child? To whom we would grant this right is unknown. But I suspect that the most industrious are going to find someone. I mean, take me, she says. I no longer have parents. They're dead. Am I going to demand the right to have parents? Stage a hunger strike until some court or the other decides to give me a new set, being unable to give me back the old ones since science has not yet figured out how to bring the dead back to life? No, let's be sensible. A child is neither a right nor a necessity. It's simply a possibility. And this, I love that she says this, and I love that she says this right at the beginning, because that really is um, the crux of the matter. You maybe want children, you maybe don't want children, you maybe can have children, you maybe can't have children. It's all just a possibility. And Every person on earth who is alive, who has a mind that is thinking, has the right to decide for themselves whether or not they want to go for that possibility. Moving on to reason number two, not to have children. And here is an expected one, and one which cannot be understated, in my humble opinion. Labor is torture. The joys of giving birth, that's brainwashing. Except for the very few women whose bodies are tube-shaped, childbirth hurts a lot. Yes, an epidural is an enormous help, but even with that, the delivery itself is far from fun. Speaking for myself, it was the most painful thing I have endured in an admittedly sheltered life. Women who say giving birth was the most beautiful moment of my life always seemed suspect to me, and once I had actually gone through it, I knew they were lying. Some women will say cautiously, oh, I don't remember a thing, which is just another way of saying I don't want to talk about it. The reality is that a delivery takes hours, sometimes a whole day. You're immobilized like some giant beetle with a pin stuck through your back. The contractions make you feel like you're exploding. Labor is pain, blood, and exhaustion. And shit, too, it seems, but that's a gift to the midwife, to the midwife or the doctor. And can I just tell you, as someone who has never given birth and never attended a birth, that I was like, in my early 30s, before I knew that a lot of women poop when they give birth because you're just pushing and everything comes out. And I just thought that has got to be one of the worst parts of the design. I mean, besides the fact that the thing that's trying to come out is trying to come out of a place that's generally too small for it to pass through. The fact that it can come out and you can be shitting at the same time is just wrong. That's, that's just, that is torture. That's horrible. 
Yeah. And of all the stories that we've read on this channel, of all the women who have commented and told their stories on regretful parents and, and all the, the way their body is distorted, the way their, their lady bits are crooked afterwards. I mean, it, I looked up fourth degree vaginal tears from birth and that will cure just about anyone of wanting to go through childbirth and labor and delivery. So reason number three of 40 good reasons not to have children, you avoid becoming a walking pacifier. Professional baby lovers all hammer the same thing into us. Nursing your baby is fabulous. Breast is best, as they say. Primal, natural, out in the open air. No pesticides, no genetically modified foods. Breastfeeding may have gone out of style in the 60s and 70s, but it's been back for a while now with a vengeance. Countless articles extol the benefits of breastfeeding. The baby will be healthier and have fewer allergies. And of course, there's just no substitute for this bonding with the bonding time with the child. And you have to remember that this book was written in France in the mid aughts. So what she talks about may be a little bit different than what's going on nowadays. In case simple persuasion isn't enough to convince the rare holdouts, the ill-informed, they're now being bribed with money. In 2003, the first health insurance bank of Morbihan in Brittany, France, decided to offer a breastfeeding premium to women who agreed to nurse their babies for at least one week. What's next? Income tax relief for nursing women? Not a bad idea. Uh, why not a bonus for every woman who refuses the epidural since a delivery without anesthetic is more natural and probably better for the infant? When I told the maternity ward staff that there was absolutely no question of my nursing my baby, the attendant looked at me disapprovingly and told me that this was not good. A month later, the gynecologist accused me of refusing to connect with the baby. The noose is tightening on those unworthy women who bottle feed. Next, they'll be pointing the finger at us in public. And I don't know if this is a French thing where, you know, women don't want to wreck their breasts or they don't want to go through the pain and um, aggravation of breastfeeding and all of that. And maybe they pump their breast milk and then bottle feed. I don't know exactly what she's talking about, but she goes on to say that breastfeeding is slavery. First of all, it's painful. And have you ever seen a nursing woman's breasts? Not attractive. They're scored with creases. There are milk clots on the nipples. They're disgusting. What's more, the poor mother is locked into being totally available to the nursing child to whom she is constantly attached. And I would have to say, I mean, I don't have to think about it because I never wanted kids and I never had kids. But when I was a kid, a very little kid in the mid 70s, my mom actually was in the La Leche League, which taught women how to breastfeed. Because as Corinne said, in the 60s and 70s, breastfeeding fell out of favor. But then in the 70s, it began to come back and uh, women got together in homes just like my mom's. Uh, we used to have women come over and sit in a circle and she would use a doll and show uh, expectant mothers how to breastfeed. A lot of women are unable to breastfeed or, you know, it's, it's not the nature takes over, you know, we're not exactly like animals where it just happens. And even in the animal world, um, it doesn't necessarily just happen. At the barn that I ride, they breed horses and there have been baby f horses born and the, uh, you have to kind of like milk the mother horse to get her milk to come in. So it's, it's not as natural as you might think. Breastfeeding. Ew, so glad I never had to worry about that. My breasts are pristine. Thank you. Number four. You get to keep having fun. <laughs> well, duh. 
Having children is an unconditional and irrevocable commitment. Whether to have them is therefore the most nerve-wracking decision you'll make in your entire life. Well, for some people, for a lot of people still today, unfortunately, they just breed with reckless abandon. Here are some of the personal freedoms you used to enjoy before you were saddled with a kid. One, sleeping through the night, very rare during the first few months, and many new parents will tell you the first few years. Sleeping in all morning, difficult when the brat comes and jumps on your stomach at the crack of dawn. Deciding to go at the last minute to a movie. Staying out after midnight, you have to relieve the babysitter, and if you do stay out past midnight, you have to either drive her home or pay for her taxi. And that reminds me, uh, one time I went out with a, a guy that I was crazy about. He happened to have a seven-year-old daughter, and he was a single dad at the time. And we went out to uh, a concert in downtown Austin, and he had to leave at midnight to go pick up his daughter. And the fucking show hadn't even started yet. We're still waiting for the band to come on. It's midnight. He's like, well, I gotta go. So fucking lame. Don't have kids if you want to have a life. She's going on with her list of things you give up. She's, I mean, so French, right? Going to a museum or an art show. The kid starts bawling after just five minutes. Traveling anywhere except to stupid destinations featuring beaches, the sea, or daycare going away any time other than school holidays. And this applies to people with children from five right up to 18 when they graduate high school. Drinking before the kid's bedtime because putting a child to bed when you are drunk just isn't done. Well, maybe not in France, Ms. Meyer, but have you been to the States? Smoking in front of your kid. <laughs> Nowadays, it's a crime against humanity. So French. <laughs> yes, <clears throat> in the U.S., smoking in front of your kid is is quite quite the no-no. Going on to number five, rat race plus rugrats. No thanks. Life with kids is life trivialized. You get up every day at the same time. You take them to daycare or to kindergarten or to school. Then you go to work. Then in the evening, you rush home to look after their bath, their homework, their supper, and get them to bed. And that's it every day. Criminals are released on bail wearing electronic security bracelets that allows the authorities to track them wherever they go. You. You won't need one. Your kid will be your ankle shackles. <laughs> oh, God. Corinne does not mess around. She goes on to say, the naive will say, oh, but looking after children isn't work. Seriously? <laughs> Seriously? Raising kids means sticking to schedules, doing chores. It is sweat, tears, and guaranteed tedium. In Austria, women can now calculate the amount of time they're devoted, they devoted to child raising when they negotiate their legal age of retirement. Oh my God. What a civilized country, huh? If looking after children were agreeable and rewarding, people would do it for free. But that's not the case. Nobody wants to look after your children without financial compensation, except, of course, your own parents, who will exact some form of payment eventually, which I'll get to later. The daycare worker, the teacher, the babysitter, they all get paid. Not very well, mind you. All the jobs connected to children are undervalued, and child professionals find themselves always less well paid than those who look after adults. Child psychologists, aren't they less respected than shrinks for adults? And school teachers are paid less than university professors. Why? because they have undertaken a painful and unrewarding task. The child, what a dreary subject. I couldn't agree more, Corinne. Number six on the list of reasons, not the list of, number six on the list of 40 good reasons not to have children. You keep your friends. As is well known, 
Love makes you stupid. The smitten man who talks about his sweetheart nonstop for hours, listing her wonderful qualities and quoting her bon mots, drives everyone crazy. It's the same with the bedazzled mother, marveling at the wonder her body has produced, who bores her friends to tears with her excessive parental devotion. As the great playwright George Cortelyn once said, one of the most marked effects of the arrival of a child in a home is to render completely idiotic the wonderful parents who without it would have simply been imbeciles. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we all know how that goes. You have friends and the friends have kids and then that's all they talk about. They just turn into mommy and daddy bots and that's all they can talk about is their children. One of my first friends to really do the traditional get married, have children kind of thing. I remember when her two daughters were very small, uh, she was like, well, yes, I have to get up at, you know, 530 in the morning. And if I don't take a shower right then, then I don't get a shower because then the kids are up and they're constantly on me and blah, 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 blah. And all I could think about is you don't get to take a shower. Like your husband can't watch the kids for 15 minutes while you take a shower. Um, okay. But then I started reading the regretful parents subreddit and that's like a thing like new parents, they often, you know, don't get to take a shower because the kid it needs constant supervision and, and they're so exhausted and so worn out by the end of the day that by the time the kid goes to sleep, they don't have the energy to take a shower. They, they wear the same clothes day after day after day. <sighs> I don't know. I don't remember not taking a shower being like a thing, you know, like maybe among my mom's when my mom was a kid, you know, my mom is the oldest of six. I guess if you have a shit ton of kids, you get the older ones to take care of the younger ones. I mean, I don't remember my mother missing any showers because I was the oldest. And so I had to watch my three brothers. It's a weird thing to, to think about. Moving on. Number seven of the 40 good reasons not to have children. You won't have to use that idiot language when talking to kids. And I appreciate this one because I do use that idiot language talking to my dogs back there. Well, they can't really see both of them, but there's two of them back there, Kubi and Mo. And I am home with them all day and I work from home and I, they sleep in the bed with me cause I'm single right now. And I probably will be single as long as I have these two dogs because they just love their life so much. They love to settle in the bed and they love to, uh, be with me all day and and we have this routine that they love and I am constantly talking the dog mama voice uh to the baby so Kooby Kooby is the best Kooby who ever Koobied and that's kind of the same like stupid language that we use talking to children <laughs> from Corinne Meyer's book there actually is a special language for talking to kids ever wanted to learn it I shall explain the basics to you. The French version of this language does not allow the imperative, which is replaced by the indicative. So you don't say, Camille, say goodbye and go to bed. But Camille, you're saying goodbye and you're going up to bed. The most common phrase of all is, you are calming down, or we are calming down, which is repeated like a mantra, and is normally totally ignored. If the imperative is ever actually used, it's ineffective. Sit down, as opposed to, let's sit down, is repeated over and over and over again as a sort of refrain. Usually, you speak to kids in the present tense, the future quietly being allowed to disappear. Papa is coming in a moment. Tomorrow you are doing your homework. And for the past tense, there's only one form, the present perfect. Have you cleaned up your room, Melissa? With children, lang language resembles a nursery rhyme. When the children are a bit older, 
you can expect to hear parents saying sugared over things like, Cassandra, if you burn the cat's fur like that, he might die, and you really don't want him to die now, do you? The child, for its part, returns tit for tat, treating the adult like an imbecile, speaking in a language that is in keeping with all this. Children's talk swarms with boring questions, such as, at the swimming pool, when you relax, can you make yourself sink without moving? Or, would you like me to give you a very painful injection in the heart that'll turn you into a tree? It took me some years to admit to my kids that I was not interested in replying. You're not supposed to do that. You can't say, shut up, I'm thinking about something important. The solution is simple. Don't listen. My kids think I'm just distracted, which is not untrue. When they're yammering at me, I frequently find myself drifting off into pleasant mental spaces, the books I want to write, vacations on my own with a stranger on a dream island, or simply a night of Beaujolais with some girlfriends. In a word, child free. So yeah, I mean, we've all heard the, the little kids, but why, why, but why, why, why mom, why mom, dad, 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 why? Ugh, could not freaking take it. One time, the same guy who had the kid who had to leave the concert at midnight before the band started, he had stayed over my house. Uh, his kid was off at her mother's house for the weekend and I lived in an apartment and there was a pool in the courtyard outside and you could hear because the weather was nice we had the window open and you could hear some kid in the pool going dad 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 and my at the time boyfriend was asleep and in his sleep he's going yeah yeah he's answering because he's he's got one ear open constantly to hear the kid without relief that's what the, the end of this chapter is. Child parent dialogue is insanity without relief. <laughs> yes, that is true. Number eight of the 40 good reasons not to have children from Corinne Meyer's book, No Kids. Open the nursery, close the bedroom. Get that image of kids as little angels out of your head. Child rearing is war, and that's not just a metaphor. More and more parents are actually getting beaten up by their kids. While you're waiting for her to get old enough for you to legitimately give her a smack, your little sweetie will have you repeating things like, stand up straight, don't put dirty napkins on the table, chew with your mouth closed, clean up your room, pick up your dirty things, do your homework. The child testing her power over you will deliberately harass you until you're right at the edge. If you are raised, or if you are raising several of them, it's double or triple indemnity, especially in blended families, which are said to represent modernity, for lack of a more meaningful word. For a woman, this means raising not only her own children, but also at least one of someone else's. And here's an interesting passage in this chapter, open the nursery, close the bedroom. Sexual repression was never just about fear of unwanted pregnancy. For almost the whole of the 19th century, that's the 1800s, parents and teachers joined together in their struggle against an atrocious scourge, child masturbation. It was said to undermine children's health and leave them exhausted. It's hard to understand today how jerking off scared society so much back then, but let's try an explanation all the same. The fear is related to enduring, to an enduring and powerful principle. One is not good, but two is okay. And Based on this same principle, cloning is to reproduction what masturbation is to sex. Have erotic pleasure alone? Make a baby out of only your own genes? There's some, they're the same scandal. But why are they scandalous? Because it is not advisable to do alone what you could and should be doing with another. 
What a great way to force someone into a couple, someone who left to herself might well evade the fundamental needs of society by refusing horror to reproduce. What does this have to do with children? The soothing and protective language society uses on that subject is a thin disguise for the subtext, forward march. Ever since the Raelians announced their so-called cloned baby in 2002, the press has been talking about the violation of all the laws against experimenting on humans and the irreversibility and the irreversible that will inevitably follow the abomination, the monstrosity of this assault on morality. Why is it so shocking that a baby would be its mother's clone? Let's be serious. We're all clones already, not of one of our parents, but of our neighbors and colleagues. The line is no longer love one another, but be just like one another. It's like tomatoes or green peas or potatoes. Everything has to be exactly the same size in order to fit in the little boxes. And that's crazy. I don't even know how this chapter goes. I don't even know how this chapter relates to open the nursery, close the bedroom. But basically, if you're going to have kids, your sex life is going to suffer for it. And I, I think of my great grandparents. My grandfather was the youngest of 15 in a three bedroom house, 15 kids. If you had a kid every year, which Catholics, Catholic families did back then, your oldest would be roughly 15 when you have your youngest baby. How do you have that many kids and keep having sex? Well, you're having sex with your kids around and so be it. But nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, people want to keep the romance in their life. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about right now. We're on to number nine. Kids are the death of desire. Not every child kills love, but most kill lust. The aesthetic assault on the woman's body transforms her for months into something resembling an overstuffed beast, which forces her to dress in sack-like clothing. You can go on for as long as you want about how a pregnant woman looks gorgeous and fulfilled, but I don't buy it. When I was pregnant, I saw myself as ugly with a huge growth pushing out from under my breasts. A number of comments from friends between the fruit and the cheese convinced me of one thing. They don't talk about a whole lot in today's parent or parents magazine. Maybe a lot of men find their pregnant wives or girlfriends to be lovely enough, but they don't seem to want to make love to them. And so with pregnancy comes a long sexual winter. And that's not a case of I have good news and bad news. This bad news will not be followed by good. No, the deprivation won't be over when the child arrives. You just don't feel much like making love after you've had an episiotomy. And even if you do, it's going to hurt for weeks. You don't know about episiotomies? The dictionary tells us that an episiotomy is an incision of the perineum, starting at the vulva used during childbirth. In other words, the butchering of the most intimate part of your anatomy, ladies. One of the parts that allows you to come. And that's just like a whole video of itself. I can honestly say, as someone who does not have children, who has never given birth, who has never attended a birth, I legit was in my 50s. I'm 53 right now. But I literally was in my 50s when I learned that not only can a woman tear backwards from the vagina to her butthole and have that tear open, 
she can tear upwards from the vagina up and tear her clitoris in half. And I, I can't, I, I, uh, I cannot even, I cannot even believe that this is a thing that this is a common thing that women have had to deal with since time immemorial and that nobody talks about it. And that I, I, as far as I know, an episiotomy is when the doctor does the cutting. And then I've also read that it's better to tear naturally. <gasps> no, 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 no. I, I want no part of any part of my lady bits tearing anywhere. This is insanity. And even if you don't tear, you still have to wait a couple of months to have sex so that things can go back where they're supposed to be. And she doesn't even get into this in this book, but I've heard that in France, every woman that gives birth automatically gets pelvic floor physical therapy afterwards to make sure everything goes back to where it's supposed to. Of course, in France, you know, of course, they're so to Americans, we think they're so advanced and, and compared to the ridiculous puritanical misogynistic ways of Amer the American healthcare system, France is advanced because I've had vaginal surgery and they didn't even offer me pelvic floor PT to put things back. I cannot even anyway. If you want a sex life, don't have children. Number 10, the final reason on this post. <laughs> God, this is exhausting. Number 10 of the 40 good reasons not to have children. Kids are the death knell of the couple. Hello, little one. Bye bye sex. And this is like the third or fourth reason in the first 10 that deal with the fact that when you bring a baby into the situation, it's not, oh, we're a couple and we have this great baby. It's now you're kind of each like a separate parent and your focus is the baby rather than your focus being on each other. And that was one huge reason why I could never humor or, or even consider having kids one day because I wanted always to be the main focus of the relationship, any relationship I was in to, to be a couple, to love the person. And I, anyway, let's go on. Corinne explains it far better than I do. Hello, little one. Bye-bye sex. This one really is not solvable within the family. Desire hinges on spontaneity, on the unexpected, on the inventiveness of the partners. And it's going to be reduced to almost nothing when you have a kid, let alone more than one. You'll be first and foremost, daddy or mommy. You'll no longer exist in the first person. When you talk to the kid, you'll say things like, mommy doesn't agree that you should put snot on the picture, Elijah. After a few years, you'll see, you'll become only daddy and mommy. And 20 or 30 years after that, you'll simply be grandma and grandpa. So does putting the children first really toll the couple's final knell? Most of the time, yes. When you have children, you can no longer be a capricious young thing having fun with her girlfriends or arousing her lover. So French. You are no longer the high-spirited young guy living like a bohemian, not caring about the state of your bank account at the end of each month. You may become grandpa and grandma, but not necessarily with each other. Statistically, your chances of growing old together are pretty small. Raising kids will have exhausted them. You won't have been able to hold on to enough for yourselves. He will see only the matron who looks after the house and the budget and the kids. You will see only an old man with disgusting love handles who tinkers around in his workshop on the weekends and occasionally cooks something. Cinderella is transformed into a maid and Prince Charming into a toad. Yikes! No, thank you. 
So those are the first 10 reasons of Corinne Meyer's No Kids, 40 Good Reasons Not to Have Children. We'll be looking at the next 10 reasons in the next post. If you made it this far to the end, then props to you, folks. I sure appreciate you being here, and I will absolutely see you in the next video.